in addition to praying the rosary on the five first Saturdays of the month and making the communion of reparation, Our Lady has asked us to keep her company for 15 minutes, meditating upon one of the mysteries contained in her holy rosary. Today we join her in contemplating the institution of the Most Holy Eucharist. According to Venerable Mary of Agreda, the Apostles asked our Lord where he wished to celebrate the Paschal Supper. For on that Thursday night the Jews were to partake of the Lamb of the Pasch, a most notable and solemn national feast. The eating of the Paschal Lamb was the most prophetic and significant feast of the Jews in anticipation of the Messiah and of the mysteries connected with him and his work. Even so, the Apostles were as yet scarcely aware of its intimate connection with Christ. The Divine Master answered by sending St. Peter and St. John to Jerusalem to make arrangements for the Paschal Lamb. This was to be in a house where they would see a servant enter with a jug of water and whose master they were required in Christ's name to prepare a room for the Last Supper with his disciples. This man lived near to Jerusalem, rich and influential. He was at the same time devoted to the Saviour and was one of those who had witnessed and had believed in his miracles and teaching. The author of life rewarded his piety and devotion by choosing his house for the celebration of the great mystery, and thus consecrated as a temple for the faithful of future times. The two apostles immediately departed on their commission, and following the instructions, they asked the owner of this house to entertain the master of life for the solemn celebration of this feast of the unleavened bread. St. Alphonsus, in his romantic fashion, describes our Lord's sentiments. Knowing that the time of his death and departure from this world had come, and having hitherto loved men even to excess, he wished to give them the last and greatest proof of his love. Behold him, seated at table, all on fire with charity, turning to his disciples and saying, With desire have I desired to eat this pasch of you, that is, my disciples, know that I have desired nothing during my whole life but to eat this last supper with you, for after it I shall go to sacrifice my life for your salvation. Happy you, O beloved John, who leaning your head on the bosom of Jesus, did then understand the tenderness of the love of this loving Redeemer for the souls that love him. Ah, my sweet Lord, you have frequently favoured me with a similar grace. Yes, I too have felt the tenderness of your affection for me when you consoled me with celestial lights and spiritual sweetness. But, after all your favours, I have not been faithful to you. Ah, do not permit me to live any longer unfaithful to your goodness, ungrateful to your goodness. I wish to be all yours. Accept me and assist me. Venerable Mary explains the washing of feet. Having washed the feet of Peter, the Divine Master then proceeded to wash also the feet of Judas, whose perfidious treason could not prevent the charity of Christ from secretly bestowing upon him tokens of even greater charity than upon the other apostles. Without permitting it to be noticed by the others, he manifested his special love towards Judas in two ways. On the one hand, in the kind and caressing manner in which he approached him, knelt at his feet, washed them, 
kiss them and press them to his bosom. On the other hand, by seeking to move his soul with inspirations proportionate to the dire depravity of his conscience, for the assistance offered to Judas was in itself much greater than that offered to the other apostles. But, as the disposition of this apostle was most wicked, his vices deeply ingrown upon him, his understanding and his faculties much disturbed and weakened, as he had entirely forsaken God and given himself over to the devil, he resisted all divine advances and inspirations that were connected with this washing of his feet. St. Alphonsus draws us now to the Holy Eucharist. In no other action can the Saviour be considered more tender or more loving than in the institution of the Holy Eucharist, in which he, as it were, annihilates himself and becomes food in order to penetrate our souls and to unite himself to the hearts of his faithful servants. Thus we are united with that Lord, on whom the angels dare not fix their eyes, and are made one flesh. What shepherd has ever fed sheep with his own blood? Jesus, in the sacrament, nourishes us with his own blood, and unites us to himself. And why become our food? Because he loved us ardently, and by making himself our food, he wished to unite himself entirely to us, and to make himself one thing with us. Jesus Christ wished to perform the greatest of his miracles in order to satisfy his desire of remaining with us, of uniting in one our heart and his most holy heart. O oh, wonderful is your love, O oh, Lord Jesus! You wish to incorporate us in such a manner with yourself that we should have one heart and one soul inseparably united to you. Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich describes the scene. Jesus blessed the Passover loaves, and I think the oil also that was standing near. Elevate, he then elevated the plate of bread with both hands, raised his eyes towards heaven, prayed, offered, set it down on the table, and again covered it. Again, Jesus prayed and taught. His words, glowing with fire and light, came forth from his mouth and entered into all the apostles, excepting Judas. He took the plate with the morsels of bread and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. While saying these words, he stretched forth his right hand over it, as if giving a blessing, and as he did so, a brilliant light emanated from him. His words were luminous, as also the bread, which as a body of light entered the mouth of the apostles. It was as if Jesus himself flowed into them. I saw them penetrated with light, bathed in light. Jesus' movements during the institution of the Most Blessed Sacrament were measured and solemn. They were preceded and followed by explanations and instructions. Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich describes, I saw the apostles after each, after each event noting down something in a little parchment roll that he might carry with him. Jesus, turning to the right and left, was full of gravity. He was always like this when engaged in prayer. Every action indicated 
the institution of the Holy Mass. I saw the apostles when approaching one another and in other parts of the ceremony, bowing as priests are accustomed to do. Jesus gave to the apostles an instruction full of mystery. He told them how they were to preserve the blessed sacrament in memory of him until the end of the world. He taught them the necessary forms for making use of it and communicating it and in what manner they were, uh, they were by degrees to teach and publish the mystery. He told them likewise when they were to receive what remained of the consecrated species, when to give some to the Blessed Virgin and how to consecrate it themselves after he had sent them the Comforter. Venerable Mary of Agreda explains how our Lord himself received the Blessed Sacrament. While receiving his own body and blood, Christ our Lord composed a canticle of praise to the Eternal Father and offered himself in the Blessed Sacrament as a sacrifice for the salvation of men. He took another particle of the consecrated bread and handed it to the angel Gabriel. Now listen, my children, what occurs next. The angel brought and communicated it to the Most Holy Mary. By having such a privilege conferred on one of their number, the holy angels considered themselves sufficiently recompensed for being excluded from the dignity of priesthood and for yielding it to man. The privilege of merely having even one of their number hold the sacramental body of their Lord and God filled them with a new and immense joy. In abundant tears of consolation, the great queen approached and received the sacred mystery. When Saint Gabriel with innumerable other angels present, Our Lady received it, the first after her son, imitating his self-abasement, reverence and holy fear. The most blessed sacrament was deposited in her breast. Above the heart of Our Lady, the blessed sacrament remained as a true and holy tabernacle of the Most High. There, the ineffable sacrament of the Holy Eucharist remained. It remained deposited from that hour until after the resurrection, when St. Peter said the first Mass and consecrated anew. After having, having thus favoured the heavenly princess, our Saviour distributed the sacramental bread to the apostles, commanding them to divide it among themselves and partake of it. By this commandment, he conferred upon them the sacerdotal dignity and they began to exercise it by giving communion each to himself. This they did with the greatest reverence, shedding copious tears and adoring the body and blood of our Lord whom they were receiving. They were established in the power of the priesthood as being founders of the Holy Church and enjoying the distinction of of priority over all others. Saint Bridget contemplates the mystery. The tree of life is Mary, the sweet fruit of this tree, Christ her son. We reach through the branches to pluck the fruit when we greet Mary as Gabriel did with great love. She offers us her sweet fruit to taste when she sees our hearts no longer in sin, but willing in all things the will of God. Her intercession and prayer help us to receive the most holy body of Christ, consecrated for us by the hands of men. This is the food of true life, the bread of angels, and the nourishment of sinful men. With wise thoughts, therefore, and with care, 
and with all reverence and love, receive him and eat. St. Alphonsus says, Jesus Christ complained to the servant of God, St. Margaret Mary Alacoc, of the ingratitude of men to him in this sacrament of love. To make her understand the love with which he dwells on our altars, he showed her his heart in a throne of flame surrounded with thorns and surmounted by a cross and said to her, Behold the heart which has loved men so tenderly, which has reserved nothing and which has been even consumed to show its love for them. But in return, the greater part of mankind treats me with ingratitude by their irreverence and by their contempt of my love in this sacrament. Christians do not visit Jesus Christ because they do not love him. They spend entire hours in the company of friends and they feel tediousness in conversing half an hour with Jesus Christ. To souls enamored of God, hours spent before Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament appear moments. St. Francis Xavier labored the whole day for the salvation of souls, and what was his repose at night? It consisted in remaining before the Blessed Sacrament. If, my brother, who do not feel this love for Jesus, endeavor at least to visit him every day. He will certainly inflame your heart. Ah, happy will you be if Jesus, by his grace, inflames you with his love. Then you will despise all the goods of this world. When, says St. Francis de Sales, a house is on fire, all that is within, it's thrown through the windows. Blessed Mother, teach me this love. Inflame me with this love so that I may prize Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament as you prized him, as you loved him, as much as you loved him when you carried him in your womb, when you adored him, the same Jesus in the stable at Bethlehem, when you received him from the hands of of St. John.